Hi all, I have another very interesting game of Bobby Fischer to show you. In this game he was playing against Nicholas Rosalimo. Rosalimo was born actually in Kiev in the Ukraine. He was awarded the IM title in 1950, the GM title in 1953. He actually moved to Paris with his Russian mother in 1929. Whilst in France, he finished second behind Capablanca in a 1938 tournament in Paris. He won the French Championship in 1948 and was Paris five times champion in a row. He drew two matches in 1948 and 49 with Savedi Tartakova. And in 1953, he moved to the USA to be with his father and mother. He worked as a bellhop, a taxi driver, played the accordion, and worked as a singer as well as running a chess studio to support himself so a multi-talented man he spoke five languages and earned a brown belt in judo he died of head injuries three days after accidentally falling down two flights of stairs in new york in 1975 there's an excellent documentary created by jessica fisher queen craw f uh, b5 and annie k if you want to check it out i'll put a link in the description of this video if you want to find out about Rosalimo very very interesting person uh, so in this game Fisher white against Rosalimo plays e4 we have a French defense after d4 d5 knight c3 instead of the winner bishop b4 we have knight f6 classical trying to encourage white to close the position two of the main moves bishop g5 or e5 here bishop g5 is played and quite often black is actually taking on e4 and playing bishop e7 but here we have the uh, mccutcheon variation bishop b4 so black is going to try and incur structural damage on white but um there's ups and downs of this position it's, it's actually very dynamically unbalanced here this sequence bishop drops back we have bishop takes c3 White's intention is not to try and preserve the pawn structure here. Usually, White usually plays like this because knight e4 is going to happen anyway, hitting the bishop again. Uh, knight e4 here, queen g4. It's a very, very interesting opening. Black is slightly weaker on the dark squares in theory. Plays now g6. Bishop d3, but uh, without the dark square bishop, you might not think this is too much of an issue for black. The king's in the center. Yes, it remains in the center in this line. Black strikes with c5 here. Knight f3, knight c6. And now queen f4, this is quite often played here. It's eyeing f6. Sometimes that could be useful to get to f6. It holds e5 and d4 more firmly. We see queen c7. And now h4 yeah trying to undermine black with h5 potentially but this queen c7 did set up a subtle pin on e5 which is exploited now by black with the move f5 so e takes is not possible on passant because the queen takes f4 g4 trying to undermine and open files on the king side c takes d4 c takes d4 now here it's an interesting situation because there's a temptation for black to try and make use of the king on d2 with for example getting the bishop out of the way and then playing for rook c8 later but how safe is the king here on d2 and where is the black king going to live uh this is a perhaps a slightly controversial move that was played here in knight e7 maybe black should forget about the c file for a moment and just play bishop d7 actually with the intention with the intention of casting queen side because white does have kind of pressure on the king side as well the king doesn't really ideally want to be over here because there's lines about to be opened but uh, in the game we see knight e7 and this g file is opened e takes f5 and now this very annoying bishop b5 check now, while there's a pin here, e e6 is not going to be possible in, in lines uh, to try and get the e5 square. But after this bishop b5 check, there's an interesting idea, which maybe has scared black already, that bishop d7 
doesn't seem too lucrative in this position if white is going to play dynamic aggressive chess after bishop d7 because bishop d7 there's taking and here white could employ e6 just to open up the e file and this is very dangerous this sort of position with well, the king still in the center and white's got that lovely e5 square so there's very very good compensation here for white and maybe this is the reason why we are we see the unfortunate looking king f8 it seems here the black king is not finding great safety because white does have already that pressure on the g file and you know lurking h5 uh, at the moment of course there's things like g5 holding things up maybe discouraging h5 uh, but uh, the bishop returns so there's pressure points g6 and f5 we see bishop e6 now actually we see a very very intriguing probably you, you think of this as a counterintuitive move where black does seem to be maybe having a promising position with rook c8 and queen c3 check but where does that lead exactly but here white despite his king on d2 treats this position in an interesting way just to improve one of his pieces can you guess fisher's move it's a subtle one if i give you five seconds to pause the video can you guess fisher's next move it's it's the start of a positional maneuver okay knight g1 yes i know it's looking ridiculous it disconnects the rooks it does have some very very interesting points to it that the knight is heading here to reroute to h3 and then it can go to f4 after where that is a loose piece on e6 and the f4 square would be a juicy square for the knight we see king f7 connecting black rooks knight h3 rook a c8 and it looks as though this is a little bit of a cause for concern queen c3 check we see rook hg1 the thing is what is black doing with this check black played b6 now angels suggest that maybe check was worth it with the idea of rook c4 but white can just ignore this white doesn't have to accept this exchange sack which would give black some counterplay in that d5 square white could ignore this here and play maybe with d d4 under pressure play maybe king e3 i mean it gets very very uh sharp there's also uh, some other ideas just rook a b1 it gets very very sharp this this kind of position uh so it's it's a very intriguing possibility but accepting the exchange stack is looking as though it might give black something so maybe this is the best course that black should have considered just just throwing in the check for rook c4 but we see b6 white gets on with things on the king side of h5 i mean the king lives here after all and on g5 it's just it looks very very dangerous because there'll be a knight sack and then the queen's coming into f6 and it looks like carnage this position so black dare not play g5 here that's another point of the knight coming to h3 so looking at g5 as well as hopping into f4 we see the chat now and yes there is a concern about this d4 pawn we see king e2 knight c6 hitting d4 but black is crumbling on the king side h takes g and then we see rook ad1 white lets d4 go and behind d4 of course the collapse of the pawn chain e5 but what about black's king safety black does take on d4 king f1 and then we see rook hg8 this is a very very difficult position if white's given another move there are all sorts of interesting possibilities there's the idea of rook g3 just to be able to threaten discover the text on the queen there's queen h4 to f6 so black's move here is is interesting we see rook g3 now 
and black not fearing immediately any discovered attack uh, here on this queen because there's always like the check on c4 anyway if this bishop takes there's a check on c4 hitting the king there and the queen so we see queen h4 going into f6 looks very dangerous and you might think what about queen takes e5 yeah things things are very very interesting but there's ideas like rook e1 and knight f4 to factor in uh, so a very very interesting tense position black plays knight takes e5 and we see knight f4 now so knight h5 check is now on the cards black tries to defend that with knight g4 holding the f6 square but here a change of tact can you see how fisher dismantles black in this position if i give you five seconds starting from now okay knight takes e6 here weakens f5 which weakens g4 this is actually potentially loose piece now subject to double attack yeah and a skewer of course to the rooks but the key thing is picking up material we see this check and this is the last throw of the dice if white's going to make a mistake actually white played king g1 here if king g2 then there's an interesting resource for black which actually is winning for black can you see what black can play in this position if i give you five seconds starting from now okay knight e3 check yeah it hits the queen and if if say king there then we can take the queen and then take here and then take g3 and we're winning with black but fisher sidesteps that with king g1 and is winning material here yeah the g4 loose knight and the loose rook it's it's winning material black resigned in this position it's an intriguing french defense game with lots of imbalances and interesting aspects of king's safety it did seem unfortunate how the king was over here where lines were being opened but it also it was interesting how the meltdown of the pawn structure didn't really matter by that time white had got very good attacking uh, opportunities and resources so a very very interesting aggressive game from both sides and it's you might think well fisher took some liberties but uh, yeah try and prove the white king in the center was weak it's actually very difficult to prove it it seems okay comments or questions on youtube thanks very much